the tired brain is very good at fooling itself that it's okay. So you need to really be uh, tough about assessing what your sleep needs are. Um, and if you can function optimally during the day, if you're feeling fine, then chances are you've had a good night of sleep. If you need an alarm clock to drive you out of bed in the morning, if it takes you a long time to wake up, if you crave caffeinated drinks, if your family, friends, work colleagues say, oh, you're being a bit, you know, where's your sense of humour? You know, you're a bit more irritable. And critically, if given the opportunity to sleep longer on free days or indeed on holiday, you sleep much longer. That's all telling you you're not getting enough sleep. So what we all have to do as individuals is define how much sleep that we need for optimal daytime performance. And I guess that would also depend on what we're doing, right? Because let's say, I don't know, that you have define that, hey, you know what, I keep hearing about the eight hours, but I think I sleep for, I don't know, six hours 30 each night or six hours 45. Yeah. And I'm fine. And I wake up without an alarm clock and I've got energy and I feel emotionally quite with it, you know. Yeah. But then let's say you start, I don't know, training for a half marathon or maybe at the weekends you go on long runs or something. It's also having that awareness to go, well, yeah, in the week, I may be okay with this amount. But actually, if I'm really exerting myself physically and I have a desk job Monday to Friday, maybe I need more at the weekend. And I guess the reason, I don't know what your view would be on that. One of the reasons I ask that is because I I think Roger Federer is well known to, is it 10 hours or 12 hours a night? He, I think he talks a lot about how much sleep he has and how important that is to his optimal performance as a tennis player. Yeah. A few little subtleties there. Do you think physical activity levels um, make a difference in terms of how much we need? And I guess, how would you put all that together? Well, of course, the the famous long sleeper was Albert Einstein, um, who basically (laughs) sat at his desk uh, for for every day. Um, And he needed, he, he craved 10 hours of sleep. So I think that it's probably influenced by athletic performance. Uh, And certainly, um, there are some data suggesting that really strong training is associated with slightly longer sleep, but it's not an overwhelmingly increased amount of sleep. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, Federer just needs that amount of sleep yeah. um, and for his optimal performance, same way that Einstein did. And, I, you know, in the book, I talk, I compare Einstein to Salvador Dali. You do. Um, and, um, you know, I sort of, it, it, it's great, you know, undergraduate lectures, you know, I say, well, Einstein, a classic, sort of slept 10, 10 and a half hours, so, yeah, perfect example of long sleep genius. And then, you know, one of the students said, well, what about Salvador Dali? You know, he only, he, he didn't sleep at all, really. And he, his trick was, of course, to hold a, a metal spoon um, um, uh, in his hand and sit in a chair and when the spoon dropped from his hand when he fell asleep it hit a metal plate on the floor and woke him up but of course Dali was the first to recognize that his altered state of mind because of his chronic lack of sleep gave him the sort of surreal vision to generate the art that he generated um yeah um. so it depends what's the goal <laughs> it depends what right? the goal, if the is, goal yeah. is to hallucinate and have an altered state of consciousness yeah and you need that for your job, you know what? Sleep yeah. deprive yourself all you want. Yeah, it, that's true. It, it may make you impossible to live with, um, as uh, Dali, of course, was. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but if you want an altered state of consciousness, then decide, you know, d- d- deprive yourself of sleep. Well, maybe now's a good point in the conversation to make the case for sleep, right? First of all, how sleep deprived are we as a society? And then secondly... What are those consequences? Yes, uh, sleep deprivation varies a lot because, of course, sleep need varies a lot. Um, But I think on average, people are saying that we're sleeping one, maybe two hours less than we were in the 1950s. And I, and I, I'm, I'm, I think those data are, are pretty robust. And certainly that's the case in, in adolescence, big time. Um, and so what are the consequences? Well, short-term sleep loss, we see changes in our emotions uh, and our cognitive performance. So uh, we increased levels of irritability, 
the failure to process information accurately. We do stupid and unreflective things. We are less empathetic. I mean, it's really fascinating. You, we, we fail to pick up the social signals uh, of friends and family. Um, we're less socially connected. We have uh, reduced capacity to remember things. We are less creative. Um, so all the things, reduced sense of humor. I mean, you know, all the yeah. things that make us this extraordinary creature, you know, this amazing humans, you know, all this creativity and wonderful and interconnectedness goes as a result of, of, of even short-term sleep loss. Longer term, as many individuals are experiencing at the moment, is associated with this falling asleep uncontrollably, so microsleeps. And it's estimated in the States that 100,000 crashes on the American freeway are as a result of people falling asleep at the wheel. The American Automobile Association suggests it's much greater than that, perhaps as high as 300,000. And of course, if you're falling asleep at the wheel, you, you can't stop yourself. So those crashes tend to be really bad crashes. We also see that there's changes in immune uh, responses. So it's likely because we're chronically tired, we're activating in a sustained way the stress axis. And that's going to push up blood pressure. It's going to throw glucose into the circulation. So it pre then disposes to things like obesity, type 2 diabetes. And indeed, because of the suppression of the immune system, higher rates of infection and indeed um, cancer. Some very convincing studies showing that night shift work, for example, uh, night shift nurses have higher rates of colorectal cancer and breast cancer. In fact, those data are now so good that the World Health Organization has listed night shift work as a probable carcinogen. So, so I, I think the really key point is that chronic sleep loss is so much more than feeling, feeling tired at an inappropriate time. It's associated with an impact upon our health at every level. Yeah, I mean, what you just went through there, it, it, it impacts negatively our our day-to-day -day lives. You mentioned empathy. I mean, what do we need for good quality relationships yeah. with partners, children, work colleagues, family? Mm. We need empathy. Yeah, and, 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 and or invariably in the workplace, you need creativity. You need people to be able to work together. You want to reduce irritability. You need often yeah. a good sense of humour. And so really, we should be really promoting good sleep to Im improve productivity. Yeah, it speaks to something you said earlier on in our conversation that when we are sleep deprived, we forget all the positive experiences and remember the negative ones, yeah. which of course completely alters your view and perception of the world. It yeah. feels like this dark, scary place rather yeah. than an uplifting, hopeful, joyful place. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, yes, these short-term consequences, but also these pretty scary long-term consequences. Now, yeah. one thing I really appreciate about the messages you try and put out there into the public is you, you really seem to be trying to help promote health without scaring people. Yep. Now, of course, these statistics are scary. And there's two groups of people I want to keep at the forefront of our mind now as we think about these negative side effects. We mentioned shift work, and I want to talk about shift work because what I read in your book is that one in eight UK workers currently are shift workers. Yep that's probably only going to increase. That's a lot of people. Yes. And I can't imagine what it's like for a shift worker to just hear what you said the WHO say, which is yeah. a probable carcinogen. Yeah. That's not a nice thing to hear no. if you work shifts, if you're a, whatever, if you're a nurse looking after people to help their health and you think, yeah, but at the same time, I'm wrecking mine in the process. So shift work is something I want to talk about. But also the other thing I've noticed as I've been trying to raise awareness of sleep now in books and podcasts for maybe five years. Unwittingly, we can often end up scaring people and making them feel worse and more anxious. Now, young parents often will get in touch and say, look, you know, uh, love, what you, love what you said. You know, I understand about sleep, but I'm really worried. Mm -hmm. My three-month-old doesn't sleep through the night you know, or whatever is going on, so many parents get really scared when they hear this sort of stuff. So if we address parents first of all, short-term sleep deprivation, long-term, is it okay for a few years of a parent sleep deprived? You know, help us sort of get less scared about that if you yeah, can. Yeah, well, I think there's two issues here. Um, one thing 
that that our society, or the de- in the developed nations at least, uh, has shifted very rapidly from the extended family yeah. to the nuclear family, where the parents become the sole providers for their children. Um, and it's usually the mother. And uh, what's happened up until fairly recently is that childcare was a distributed activity. And so when the mum got tired, there was an aunt or a sister or a friend who would take over so that the mum can get some sleep. And if you look at the primate societies, uh, you see that uh, care is distributed across the group. We have never yeah. evolved to be the sole uh, parents, as it were, of, of our children. And I think the first point to make is that young mums in particular, but, 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 but both parents, uh, should not be afraid to reach out. And I think there's this sort of terrible guilt that I can't cope because I'm feeling tired. Well, no surprise. We never evolved to, to look after our children in this manner. So before babies are born, it's really important to think about the support network that you can put in place to, to, to try and mitigate some of the, the chronic sleep loss. Now, what are the long-term consequences of this? It's, it's not clear. Uh, I suspect that there are probably buffers that kick in that actually um, prevent some of, the, some of the damaging effects of, of chronic sleep loss during those sort of few months. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and in fact, I think it's a really important area of, of, of study. Yeah. I think, you know, what you said there, I think is really helpful. First of all, just recognize that the way we're bringing kids up now is tough. Yeah. We never had to do it like this. You know, recently, Russell, my wife's father has been away in Kenya for a couple of months to see his yeah. family. And my mother-in-law has been staying with us on and off for a couple of months. Mm. And let me tell you the difference. It, you just, it's, it's little things, but just having a third adult in the house yes. when it comes to childcare, it, it, it's not just one more person. It, it seems to have changed everything. The whole dynamic the changes. The whole dynamic yeah. changed. Yeah. I, I was Absolutely. like, this is incredible. This is what humans have always done, yet yeah. many of us have moved away for work, for opportunity. We don't have those support systems. So I thought that hopefully takes the pressure off people to at least go, yes, I know it's hard, but yes, it is hard. It really is hard. You're, mm. not, you're not broken. It's not that you can't no. cope. No, none of us can cope with that. Yep. So I think that's a really nice message. But also that message, you can reach out, you know, yes. maybe you need to phone a friend and say, hey, listen, I'm knackered. Could I just have a nap? Could you come while I have a nap? And it's not a sign of weakness. Yeah. It's, it's actually, you know, em- embracing our biology in a sense. Um, and and I, it's, it's tragic that I think that young parents don't know that um, and feel guilty about it. It's, it's simply wrong. And, it, and it's, you know, it's so many unintended consequences that we're facing at the moment and and sort of with increased wealth and independence you know we think right you know we don't have to live with our parents anymore or we can move a long way away from them and yet we've we've lost something in the process i mean i was you know my my i was my i very close to my grandparents who looked after me while my my mother was working and it was a as you as you say it was a meant you know a, a big thing so mummy's coming home and it was all you know excitement and yeah. and you have that dynamic environment um and clearly you know we are where we are but but people shouldn't be afraid to reach out i think that's so important if you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20%. You would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep. Or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. 